Our scripture text today is the first 15 verses of Hebrews 9. Now, you know, if your Bible's like mine, you've had it for a while, some pages are browner than other pages. On the corners, you know, because you've been to those chapters more often with dirty hands. And so uh, Hebrews 9 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And we're going to read the first 19 verses this morning. So would you please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Hebrews 9, 1 through 15. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. And behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priests are continuing, continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second only the high priest enters, once a year, not without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed, while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is the symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. You may be seated. How long do you have to get through those 15 verses? You know, I don't know of any chapters in the Bible that more clearly and carefully explain the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ than Hebrews 7, 8, and 9. This is a great place to go to help somebody that you're trying to lead to Christ. The three most basic fundamentals of the gospel are explained in those chapters. Chapter 7, a superior mediator. Chapter 8, a new covenant. Chapter 9, a perfect sacrifice. There is no gospel without those things. Uh, chapter 7, uh, there is a superior me mediator, the only mediator and high priest that can do you any good. And that is to get you into the favor of God by his own life, death, and resurrection. And once he died on the cross and arose and ascended to God's hand, he put into, new, uh, into place a new order on this earth called the new covenant that changed everything and that gave God's people the ability to obey him in all the things that he's called them to do. And all of that, Hebrews 9, is based upon a perfect sacrifice that he made of himself 2,000 years on a cross. And today we're going to talk about, or begin talking about, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the first 15 verses of chapter 9. But before I do, I want to remind you of something. Take a little excursus here for a minute. Uh, excursus is a big word for rabbit trail. Uh, 
on something that I've, I've tried to explain every Sunday because there's so much confusion about it. People use verses in the book of Hebrews to teach that God did away with the Old Testament when he brought in the New Testament. That God did away with all the Old Testament covenants when he brought in the New Covenant. And all those covenants that God made in the Old Testament now are abrogated. They are not a part of the Christian life. They were for the Jews of another dispensation. That dispensation's over. And now we have the new covenant in Christ, which is completely different than anything taught in the Old Testament. Now, people use verses in the book of Hebrews to teach that view. It's called New Covenant Theology. That the New Testament, the covenant of the New Testament, is something completely other and completely different than anything in the Old Testament. But we've tried to show, as we come across those verses in the book of Hebrews, that that results, that view results from a careless reading of the book of Hebrews. And the same thing is going to be true here. Now, lest you think I'm making this up as I go along, lest you think I'm the only person who believes this, or that I just invented it, I'm going to read to you a little paragraph from John Calvin. Now, you might not like John Calvin. That's not my point here. I just want you to show I didn't, I, I didn't make all this up. That this is historic reform Christianity. Listen to what Calvin says in his commentary on Jeremiah. Now, as to the new covenant, it is not so called because it is contrary to the first covenant, for God is never inconsistent with himself. God in the gospel brings forward nothing but what the law contains. We hence see that God has so spoken from the beginning that he has not changed, no, not a syllable, with regard to the substance of doctrine. For he has included in the law the rule of a perfect life and has also shown what is the way of salvation by types and symbols to lead his people to Christ. In other words, as we said off and on uh, throughout this series, that the essence of God's covenant that he made all the way back when Adam and Eve ate the fruit and fell out of the garden, that all the way back there, the whole Bible's about this one great covenant of grace, this everlasting covenant. It's still in place. Jesus didn't come to do away with it. He came to complete it. It's the way the blessings of that covenant are administered that has changed in the New Testament. In the New T Old Testament, they were administered by various rites and rituals and sacrificial system and Levitical priests and all those various and sundry things which in and of themselves couldn't do you any good. The blood of bulls and goats could not forgive sin. But in the New Testament now, the covenant that, that unifies the Scriptures is the same, but the way by which that covenant in administer is administered and the promises caused to come true in your life, and this is the point of the book of Hebrews, uh, is different. Now the ways by which God administers those promises into our lives are more simple and fewer in number, but more powerful than anything in the Old Testament. And that is by the power of the preaching of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit's use of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. So understand that the book of Hebrews, when it talks about a new covenant, it isn't talking about a different covenant. It's talking about the same covenant the whole Bible's about, but now in Christ, that covenant is completed. And what the Old Testament covenants commanded you to do, but could not forgive you if you transgress them. The Lord Jesus Christ now in the New Covenant, as we saw in Hebrews 8, actually brings forgiveness of those sins, and by the power of the Holy Spirit actually gives God's people the power to obey what the Old Covenants commanded, but could not enable you to do. Okay? So, I want us to look now at the first 15 verses of uh, this great chapter. It has two points. 
uh, verses 1 through 15. The first 10 verses, now if you're writing this down, write it exactly as I tell you, because it's, uh, well, okay. Uh, verses 1 through 10, the beauty and uselessness of Old Testament rites and rituals in tabernacle worship. Verses 1 through 10, the beauty and uselessness of Old Testament rites and rituals in tabernacle worship without Christ. Make sure you put that last prepositional phrase in there. The uselessness of all these Old Testament rituals without Christ. Now, the book of Hebrews is pretty rough. On people who try to think, now that we have Christ, we still need to have a Levitical priesthood. We still need to have the temple. We still need to have sacrificial system. And he really says some strong things about those types and, uh, and figures and sacrificial system and the like. Saying they're obsolete. They've grown old. They're ready to disappear. They cannot forgive sins. But now, bear in mind that the writer of the book of Hebrews is addressing a Christian group that's being influenced by people sort of like the people that lived at the Dead Sea. You remember you've read about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essenes and everything, and there was a sect connected with the Dead Sea that believed that you're to keep all these various rituals and all these various sacrifices, and, and that someday there's going to be the restoration of the literal temple and the literal uh, Levitical priesthood. Uh, but Christ was left out of that. Jesus Christ was left out of that. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews is addressing these people. These rites and rituals, however correct they may be, they are useless without Christ. They weren't useless for the time that they were appointed to take place. Let me read a little sentence from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Listen. It says, Old Testament types and symbols, all for signifying Christ to come, were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah. So there was a time when these rites and rituals that God imposed upon Israel had their place as long as people looked for Christ in those things and saw those various rites and rituals not as in and of themselves, not as having some kind of meritorious function, but as signposts that point to Christ. But now when Christ has come, there's no more need for the signposts. When the substance has come, all of the shadows disappear. Now let's look at some of those shadows. The first, uh, oh, let's say the first ten verses. Uh, that uh, I gave you some pictures. Does everybody have these pictures? Anybody doesn't have, raise your hand. We may maybe have some left. Do we have any left back there? No, no, there are no more. Uh, those were drawn by N. Norman, by the way. Hebrews 9, 1 through 10. Let me read them again. Because th this is such strange language to so many people. Now, even the first covenant, that is in the Old Testament, had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread, that's called the holy place. And behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot speak in detail. Now, here's some pictures. I want you to get your picture of the tabernacle. Uh, this is what he's talking about. This is the tabernacle that God gave Moses the blueprints to that served as the central sanctuary for Israel until the Solomon built the temple. Then Solomon's temple was burned down by the Babylonians in 586. And then Herod built another temple that was in existence during his life, Christ's lifetime. But what he's saying is this, is that the tabernacle had two rooms. There's two tabernacles. Two rooms. The first room is called the holy place, and the back room is called the holy of holies. And in the uh, 
courtyard, there were two things. There was a brazen altar. That's where they had sacrifices. Uh, the priest could not go into the tabernacle without sacrifice. And then there's a laver, sort of like a, a bowl, big bowl, where the priest would symbolize his necessity for cleansing in this water. And then inside the first room, you had several pieces of furniture. And in the last room, you had the Ark of the Covenant. Now, here's the pieces of furniture. So look at this one. Uh, here's the Ark of the Covenant. Pure gold. That was in the back room, the Holy of Holies. Uh, on top of it are angels with over-arched uh, wings. On the top of it was a plate of pure gold called the Mercy Seat. And then also, and that's the only thing in the Holy of Holies in Moses' day. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, at various times, it had various things. Uh, there were the original Ten Commandments. There was Aaron's rod that budded. There was a pot of manna. Sometimes all three of those things were there in the Old Testament. Sometimes they weren't. There's the altar of burnt offerings out in the courtyard. There's the laver. There's the table of showbread that was in the Holy of Holies. Uh, there is the altar of incense that was right before the veil separating the Holy of Holies from the ho holy place. And then there is the lampstand. And then the third picture is the uh, priest. The high priest with his Old Testament garb. And he represented the people before God. On his shoulder, there were in shoulders were inscribed the twelve tribes of Israel. And on his chest was a breastplate of precious stones, twelve, uh, representing the twelve tribes of Israel. So every time he went into the Holy of Holies, he represented God's people. Now, did you notice a little problem in the verses that we read? Now, what did I just say was in the Holy of Holies? One thing. The Ark of the Covenant. But, what does it say in verses 3 and 4? And behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh-oh. Either I'm wrong or the Bible's wrong. So you want to bet who's wrong? The point is, it's difficult to know from the Bible where the, ark, uh, uh, where the altar of incense was. Now, I think the King James says censer, uh, something like a little a gold shovel, but that's not what the word means. It means altar of incense. And uh, let me give you some verses. I'm not going to deal with this. You can look these up on your own. Exodus 30, verse 6. Exodus 40, verse 26. And Luke 1, through 5, 1, 5 and following. I think when you look at all those verses, it's clear that the altar of incense was just on the outside of the veil leading into the Holy of Holies. Now, what does Luke 1 have to do with it? Bill Potter can tell you. John the Baptist's daddy, Zacharias, at that particular time in his life, had the responsibility of making sure the incense was burning on the altar of incense. He was not allowed in the Holy of Holies. He was a priest, not the high priest. And only the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. And if you notice, symbolically, in the, in the structure of all those things, the uh, altar in the courtyard and the altar of incense just on this side of the veil and the Ark of the Covenant are on a straight line. That in the courtyard you have the sacrifice pointing to Christ. You come into the holy place, and before the priest goes into the very presence of God to bow before the Ark of the Covenant, there is this altar of incense which represents the prayers of God's people entering into heaven. And so as he enters behind that second veil into the Holy of Holies, the, 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 the aroma and the smoke of the altar of incense goes with him. So what does he mean when he says... That the Ark of the Covenant and the Altar of Incense are behind the veil. Because there it is, just clear as a bell. Well, remember, this is one possible solution. There's no easy solution. But here's one possible one. Remember that the writer of the book of Hebrews is addressing 
Jewish practice in the first century. In Herod's temple. Guess what, folks? The Holy of Holies, which represented the very presence of God that man is accessible to through sacrifice in Jesus' day, was empty. There was no Ark of the Covenant. How do you like that for symbolism? There was no Ark of the Covenant in Herod's temple. It was destroyed somewhere around 586 when the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem. And so maybe, to be, keep, be, uh, so it wouldn't be quite so empty, maybe they shoved the altar of incense into the Ark of the Covenant. But there are no mistakes in the Bible. Now, but you can imagine how beautiful all these things were. And they had symbolism. They were all symbols. Now, you don't look for symbolism and allegory in every little detail of these things, but all of them did have significant symbolism. But notice what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 5. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, but of these things we cannot now speak in detail. In other words, he's saying, don't get me started. Don't get me off track. I can preach all day saying, in effect, about the symbolic meaning of all these things. But that's not my point. I don't want to be diverted from my main point. And my main point is, as beautiful as all these things were, they were worthless without Christ. And he says in verse 6, and, and I want you to notice some tenses here. This is important. Now, when these things have been thus prepared, the priests are, not were. He's not talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about present. The priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing, present tense, the divine worship. But into the second only, the high priest enters once a year, not without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Now, you would think that, if, that he'd be talking about practices in the Old Testament, which is where they originated. But he's not talking about practices in the Old Testament. He's saying, I'm describing things that are taking place now in my lifetime. That's the context. The temple in Jerusalem is still standing. The last high priest is still living. The priests are still doing all of their uh, functions. The sacrifices are still being offered. All these rites and rituals are still in place. Now, what does that tell you? The last high priest died in 70 A.D. And the temple was burned to the ground and completely destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Roman armies. So what this is telling you is the book of Hebrews was written before all that when the temple in Jerusalem was still being, uh, 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 it was still the center of, of Jewish worship, and Paul is saying to them, as great and beautiful as the temple and all of those things that you know about in Jerusalem are, they are worthless without Christ. They're shadows. They were meant to pass off the scene. And so God said, and since you didn't get my point, I'm going to make sure they pass off the scene in 70 A.D. And I'm going to burn them to the ground. So that you'll realize these shadows have no place now in the new covenant. So look at verse 8. Oh, for verse 7, it says, The high priest enters the holy, holy of holies, which is the presence of God, not without blood. Now, you know, the high priest was a man of great dignity, great authority, great influence. Uh, he represented the whole covenant nation, but he could not go into the holy place in his own name. He could not go into the holy place because of his own self-worth. He had to take blood. He had to take the blood of the sacrifice out there in the altar in the courtroom and it was on the basis of that shed blood that the high priest representing God's people could enter into the kingdom of God, into the Holy of Holies. But notice what it says in verse 8. The Holy Spirit is signifying this. In other words, he's talking about the inspiration of the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. This is not of man. 
The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place, that is the real holy place, the place where God lives, as it were, the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle or literal tabernacle is still standing. Pretty clear words, don't you think? That as long as that literal sanctuary, whether it was the tabernacle in Moses' day or the temple in Jesus' day, as long as that literal tabernacle or temple is still standing, the way of access and freedom into the presence of God for all who believe is still not open. That has to be done away with. That literal tabernacle has to be done away with in order for there to be freedom of access into the presence of God by all who believe. Because it was a symbol. And it takes more than symbols to get you to God. There was a liturgy, a beautiful liturgy, but it takes more than liturgy to get you to God. That the only person that gets you into the very favor of God is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And now he's come. That old tabernacle's gone. And he is the new tabernacle. And he is the new center of the worship of Almighty God. Now notice the way it's, it's spoken of here. Uh, the Holy Spirit is signified this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed. You see any hope in that? I, I see the word, I, I see hope. I see him saying, as long as this literal temple is in place uh, and Christ has not come, uh, there's no access to all who believe, but it's coming. The day is coming when whosoever will can enter before the throne of God's grace and be accepted by him through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's hope there. Now, what could these rituals not do? They were beautiful and they were given by God, but the, what, what could they not do? Well, let's look at the, go on with the sentence in verse 9. Verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol. Let me pronounce that Greek word symbol for you. See if you know any English words that sound like this. Parable. I mean, it sort of says parable. But it's the word from which we get the word parable. So that the tabernacle or the temple, uh, temple is a parable for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So he says all these things about the tabernacle, the priesthood, the furniture, the rites, the ritual, sacrificial system, they were parables for the present time. That they do benefit us as we look back and we study these great things and see how they point to the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're unable to do the one thing that every sinner has to have done for him if he's going to enter the presence of God, and that is he's got to be made perfect in his conscience. Because the reason they can't do that is because they relate only to external things, verse 10. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation or to, until a time of a new order of things, that is the new covenant. Uh, they only can sanctify or cleanse or wash the flesh. They can only do things externally. But man needs something far deeper done to him than simply washing his body. You remember what John the Baptist said as he compared himself to Jesus? He said, Jesus is vastly superior to me. You know, John the Baptist lived in Old Testament times. He said, Jesus is far uh, far." Uh, uh, superior to me, all I can do is sprinkle a little water on your head. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. All I can do is affect you physically. That's all my rights can do. He can bring what that right symbolizes in its full reality into the heart and transfer a person's heart. So what the Lord Jesus Christ could do, the old rituals could not do, and that is they could not make the worshiper, perfect in conscience. Now understand that word perfect. It's a very important word in Hebrews. Let me take the time just to read everywhere it occurs. Look at chapter 7, verse 11. 
Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would be for another priest? Uh, verse 19 of chapter 7. For the law made nothing perfect. Chapter 9, verse 9, we've just read that. Chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of, of things, can never be the same uh, sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. Verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Chapter 11, verse 40. Because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us they should not be made perfect. And then in chapter 12, verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. You see, it's an important word. Now, understand what the word perfect means. The word perfect in the book of Hebrews is not talking about moral perfection. That's the way we think of it. If somebody's perfect, we think it, he's sinlessly perfect. He's morally impeccable. And there are times in the Bible when it does mean that, but not in the book of Hebrews. You remember, we've already discussed this word. Jesus used a form of it as one of his last sayings on the cross. It is finished. It is accomplished. It is completed. It is perfected. So in that, and the Bible says that Jesus learned perfection through suffering. That is, he was fitted for office by experienced suffering in his humanity. And the point here I'm getting at is that uh, perfection means to be complete. It means to no longer be separated from God. It means to have your sins removed the guilt of them removed from your conscience so that you walk as a free man or a free woman through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, realizing your only hope is Him. And so that's what perfect means. And all of these rites and rituals taken in and of themselves without signposts to point to Christ could not do the one thing you have to have done, and that is make your conscience perfect. Get that burden of guilt off your conscience. You can drink it off. You can try to shoot it in your arm off. You can get some kind of psychiatrist to absolve you of guilt feelings. You can get somebody to say that guilt feelings are irrelevant. All of those things are useless. Every human being upon the face of this earth has a guilty conscience. We can act like it's not there. We can suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We can callous our conscience by going against it. But nobody can escape his conscience. It's there. And it's polluted and defiled and loaded down and burdened with guilt. And as long as it is burdened with guilt, you are a sucker for anybody that wants to seduce you. Because one of the most dangerous things that you can have is a guilty conscience. If you have a guilty conscience, people will get you to do whatever they want you to do. All they have to do is just push that little guilt button. You know, that's the way the liberals do. When the time comes to vote, they push some little button making us all feel guilty. And we all vote, not all of us. We all vote the way the liberals want us to vote. So a guilty conscience makes you very vulnerable and easy to manipulate. So as long as you have an imperfect conscience loaded down from guilt, you're separate with guilt, you're separated from God, and you're easy prey for Satan and all of his tricks and devices. And all those rites and rituals, as beautiful as they were, could not unload the conscience from its burden of guilt. Have you ever heard anybody who just became a Christian say, I have many times, say that I, I felt like a burden was lifted. I felt like a burden was lifted off my back that was about to break me. Well, what he's saying is, I finally have a perfect conscience. Not that he's perfect morally, but I now have that burden of guilt lifted because the Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross was effective in doing what rites and rituals and liturgies cannot do. He removed that guilt by bearing that guilt in and of himself. And so notice again, it says, 
these sacrifices can't do you any good. Verse 9. Without Christ, he and he alone gives you a perfect conscience. Well, what is a conscience, by the way? You have a conscience by virtue of the fact that you're made in the image of God. Turn to Romans chapter 2. And let me say, show you the closest thing to a definition of a conscience found in the Bible. And it is, let's start with verse 14 of chapter 2. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. You know when you do something wrong, and you know it's wrong, and you feel guilty? That's your conscience. You know when you do something right, and you know it's right, you sort of feel good about it? That's your conscience. Because you are a human being, you have the work of God's law written upon your conscience. So that there is that law of God within you that judges you, even as an unbeliever. Even as an unregenerate unbeliever, there is a conscience with the work of the law written upon it. Regeneration republishes that law and writes it more clearly. But even in the unbeliever, when he sins, he knows he's doing wrong. He knows he's sinning against Almighty God. Because of the work of the law written upon his conscience. And that conscience loads him down with guilt. And it can only be cleansed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read to you this. Uh, I've been hesitating, but it's too good not to read by Philip Hughes. Explaining what a conscience is. Now listen, because it's a little complicated sentence, but it's great. A conscience is a Christian's inner knowledge of himself. Especially in the sense of his answerability for his motives and actions. In other words, every human being, because of his conscience, knows he's answerable to God. Have you ever heard the saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole? That is because every human being knows when he's faced with death, he's answerable to God. For his motive is in actions. Why? In view of the fact that he is a creature made in the in image of God, stands before and must give an account of himself to his creator. Every human being knows that someday he's going to have to stand before God and give an account of himself. And so that conscience right now is a, a convicted of guilt. He's painfully aware of his guilt. And he knows that things need to be made right. And no liturgy and no rite and no ritual can do it except the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we come to verse 11, which is the second part of our text. Verses 1 through 10, the beauty and uselessness of rites and rituals without Christ. And now verses 11 through 15, the perfection of Christ's once for all time self-sacrifice in our place. The perfection of Christ's once for all time, self-sacrifice in our place. Look at verse 11. But, in contrast to the ineffectiveness of everything we've been reading about thus far, and the ineffectiveness of man to do anything about his sin and his guilt, but when Christ appeared historically in his incarnation, that's what Hebrews 2 is all about, but when Christ appeared on the scene of human history as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. In other words, now he's saying, here's why Christ and his sacrifice are perfect and everything you need for salvation. Christ appeared in human history, took upon himself our humanness, because we had sinned, and so if he was going to be a sacrifice, he had to be a man as well. And when he appeared in human history, he appeared as our high priest, our mediator, our go-between of the good things to come. He's the one that would bring the good things to come to fruition. What good things to come? Hebrews 8. Last week we looked at Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 
uh, 12, when we saw the good things to come are all the promises of the new covenant, the fulfillment, the completion of all the covenants of the Old Testament in the Lord Jesus Christ and His new covenant. He came to put all those things in place, not to do away with them. And when Christ appeared as our high priest on the scene of human history, bringing with Him all the promises of the new covenant, He entered not a literal tabernacle, not a literal temple, not a literal holy of holies, but He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with hands, not of this creation, because it's in the presence of God. So He's the high priest. He became a man, sacrificed Himself uh, on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended to God's right hand, and ascended to God's right hand into the very presence of God Himself with the Old Testament temple and tabernacle merely symbolized. So He was a high priest from the moment He came to this earth. He was a high priest in sacrificing Himself. And then when He ascended to God's right hand, He continued to be our advocate and our intercessor and our forerunner and our high priest in the very presence of God. Verse 12. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, the way it's translated in the New American Standard Version is right, but it's a little cumbersome and can be misleading. Because you have some people throughout the history of the church, including today, that believe that just as the high priest had the animal slaughtered outside the sanctuary, put some of its blood in a bowl, and then walks in the Holy of Holies with the blood of that sacrifice, that since Christ is the sacrifice, He completely bled out on the cross, which there's nothing in the Bible that says that's the case, and all that blood was caught in a bowl, and now in the presence of God, our high priest, who is bloodless, but glorify, I, I'm not making this up. People do believe this. As bloodless, though exalted, has all of his blood in this bowl. And it's that bowl full of his own blood that this bloodless body offers to God. You see how far people go. Here's what it says. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, having once for all obtained eternal redemption, entered the holy place. Now you might want to write that in the margin. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he, he uh, having once for all obtained eternal redemption, he entered the holy place. In other words, remembering that all these rites and rituals can't do you any good. The Lord Jesus Christ, like the high priest, enters into God's presence, literally and truly. Not with his own the blood of animals, but with his own blood. Which blood shows that he actually obtained eternal redemption for everyone for whom he died when he died. You remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago and saw that the Reformed faith has a doctrine that nobody else has. And that's called the perfection of the atonement. It's the, it, the, the truth is not just simply that Jesus made salvation possible for anybody that wants it. The truth is that when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died once for all time. And when He died, He actually obtained or secured eternal redemption for everyone for whom He died. In His death on the cross, He actually obtained and secured salvation for somebody. Not just salvation that's temporary, eternal redemption eternal redemption from the guilt and condemnation and consequences of sin. And that obtaining of eternal redemption was achieved when He died on the cross once for all. Because then when He entered the holy place of heaven, He didn't enter as a victim to continue that sacrifice. 
He entered as a victor. His victimization ended with his death on the cross. And then when he arose from the dead and ascended God's hand, he ascended as a victor. Able to bring all of us who love him into the fellowship of God in his very presence. Verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now he talks about the ashes of a heifer sprinkling. Those who've been defiled. Why did he bring the ashes of a red heifer? Oh, well, the story of that ritual is in Numbers 19. And he could have brought up a bunch of uh, rituals, but he brought up that one because, now remember, he's addressing those that are practicing Judaism in the first century, and their Judaism is mixed up. And the sacrifice of the red heifer is the one sacrifice that did not have to take place within the uh, confines of the temple it took place outside the city and these Essenes these dead sea people lived out in the desert so here is one clear sacrifice in Numbers 19 that they didn't have to be in the temple to fulfill they could do it out there and so what he's saying to these people listen all these right things you're doing all these right rituals and these right uh, uh, liturgies that you're doing, they mean nothing anymore. They're obsolete. Not even the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who've been defiled sanctify anything but the washing of the body. And if these old rituals can cleanse the physical body, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, Offered himself without blemish to God. Cleanse your conscience. Your conscience from dead works to serve the, the living God. He says all these rites and rituals that you're counting on. They can just make your body smell better. That's about it. They can make your body a little physical, lift physically cleaner. But they certainly cannot save you from hell. And they certainly cannot bring you into the presence of God. And he's saying how much more can the blood of Christ do that? Through the eternal spirit who empowered him every step of his way. He offered himself without blemish. He had no sins of his own for which he needed sacrifice. And by that offering of himself without blemish to God, he's able to do what all these religious rites cannot do for you. He can cleanse your conscience. He can remove the guilt. He can lift the burden. He could remove that which separates you from the living God. He not only can cleanse the conscience from guilt, but he cleanses the conscience from dead works. What's a dead work? Well, a couple things. A dead work is something a dead man does. Uh, a dead work counts for nothing. It means nothing. Has no, po make no points with God. Not a good work. Because he's dead spiritually. And anything a dead man does in an effort to please God, it is dead because he's dead. You remember the uh, King James Version says in uh, Proverbs, the plowing of the wicked is sin. Even when an unbeliever plows his field to grow his vegetables to live his life, he's still sinning against God. Everything he does is sinful. That's all the poor unbeliever's ever done in his life is sin against God. He's never done any good work any of his life, however much it looks like it superficially. By the human eye. He's dead. And everything he does is a dead work. And everything he does tends toward death. He's dead. And the only person that can save you from that dead works, that dead soul, that life that tends toward death, that life that has as its wages death, is the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. But you know, the forgiveness of sins and the deliverance from guilt is not an end in and of itself. You know, this is one of the ways you can tell Christianity from all other religions. All other religions have as their goal 
obtaining forgiveness of sins. Now think about it. All man-made versions of man-made religions, whether it's a primitive paganism or whether it's a more complex paganism, have as their goal the removal of guilt. That's what everything is done for that. We make our sacrifices. We put our money in the offering plate. We take communion. We do whatever else we do to try to satisfy God and appease God and to get our sins forgiven so that when we leave this world, our sins are forgiven. That's the exact opposite of Christianity. The goal of Christianity is not the removal of guilt. That's the first thing that happens. What does our text say? Our text says, verse 14, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's the goal of the Christian's life. The goal of the Christian's life is not to spend all of his efforts and time, his religious motives, and all of his rites and rituals trying to get his sins forgiven. He receives Christ as his Lord and Savior. He rests in Christ alone for salvation and his once for all death on the cross, knowing then and there his sin was guilt, uh, removed, the guilt was cleansed. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so knowing that that blood a metaphor for his saving death on the cross. That blood and nothing but the blood can remove that conviction, that consciousness, that burden of guilt that holds him down, that separates him from God, and now I can get on with business. And he can get on with serving God. The goal of the Christian life is not forgiveness. You do that when you receive Christ. The goal of the Christian life is to serve God with all your heart and your soul. So then whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, you do all to the glory of Almighty God. That's the reason Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross to forgive you of your sins so that there would be nothing holding you back from serving God with your life. So you can say, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I believe He died for me, you can sing, uh, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All you want to. But the great proof that you're counted in the death of Christ and you really trust in that death is the life of service to Almighty God that you're trying to live by the Holy Spirit. You want to serve Him above all things. So I ask you in conclusion, tell you, uh, let me make some lessons and and give you some exhortations. First of all, the consciences of all men are wholly polluted until they're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. No matter what your friend tells you, every, the conscience of every human being is polluted and defiled and burdened by sin no matter what anybody tells you. You're going to believe man or you're going to believe God? Everybody's conscience is defiled and corrupt and weighed down until he trusts in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that removes the guilt. Second, the best works of fallen human beings are dead works until Christ's blood enables them to serve the living God. No matter how great they think they are, no matter how many biographies have written about them as being great men and great women, Everything a sinner does is dead because it originates from a dead heart until he trusts in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as his only hope for acceptance with God. And at that moment when the Holy Spirit gives him faith, the Holy Spirit also gives him the ability to produce good works. Works that bring glory and honor to Almighty God. So you've been cleansed, I trust. Now, if you're trusting in some liturgy or some rite or some ritual or some man or some merit in your own life for acceptance with God, let me encourage you to repent of that right now. Your only hope is to trust in the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and to bring you into the very presence of God throughout all eternity. You have no hope beyond that. Assuming that you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus,
Now, in your own Christian life, avoid all moral filth. You were filthy. Your conscience was filthy, and so was mine. We were cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That filth was forgiven and removed. Now, avoid at all costs all moral filth and spend the rest of your life serving the living God. In other words, don't live like a dead man anymore. That's the way a lot of professed Christians do. They just think they're poor victims to every sin coming and going. Well, I mean, I had to sleep with that woman. I just couldn't help it. Or uh, I had to take drugs. I mean, I, I just couldn't help it. Or I had to get depressed because it just came upon me like a monster. I just couldn't help it. I'm a dead man. A dead man can't help himself. Don't live like a dead man anymore. You're not dead. You're alive in Christ. But do live like a man who's appointed to die. We're going to get to that next week. It's appointed unto man. Every man wants to die. So don't live like a dead man, but do live like a man that's appointed, has an appointment to make when he stands before God. Don't think you're invulnerable. Don't think you're going to physically live and not have to go through physical death. Don't just try to avoid it. Live like a man or a woman or a young person that has an appointment to make. And that appointment is death. When you realize that, it, it makes you a little sober. It makes you a little joyful. But it gives you a new focus that you didn't have when you thought you were going to be living forever. And lastly, live like a man or a woman, or a young person. I'll put this in West Virginian first. Live like a man, or a woman, or a young person who has been died for by Jesus Christ. Live as somebody for whom Christ died. You've been bought with a price. Your conscience has been cleaned, cleansed. You're complete now in Christ. Live like somebody for whom Christ died. Benjamin Warfield was one of the four or five greatest scholars in the history of the Christian faith. He died in 1921. Taught at Princeton Seminary. And my professor, William Charles Robinson, was in his last class. And he always stood up to pray, but he was pretty shaky that day because he was going to be dead in a few days. And he was lecturing on 1 John. And he, Warfield, said to his class, and this is the last thing many of his students ever heard him say, young gentlemen, make much of the blood Make much of the blood.